All right, hello everyone. Hi, Sean. Thank you. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, a lot of familiar faces, a few new ones. I uh, hope to get a chance to meet you guys. I've met you two now. I haven't met you yet, but hello. Um, anyways, tonight I'm going to be talking about uh, some concepts that we see all the way from literal to spiritual Babylon. But before we dig into that, uh, I'd like to have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and all of your many blessings. I pray that you'll continue to guide us and teach us your ways. And uh, as I present this message, I ask that you'll touch the coals off the altar to my lips, Lord. And please help the words that I speak not be mine, but uh, let them convey your thoughts and your words, Father. Thank you so much for all the wonderful people in this room, God. I pray that you'll give them a special blessing and that uh, this message will be a blessing to them. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I have a question for you. And I like, when I talk, I like feedback. I like participation. So, will I be able to get any from you this evening? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, I've got three people participating. That's good enough. <laughs> uh, so, I have a question. We are, we're all familiar with the fact that there's a battle between Christ and Satan. It's been going on since the beginning. But why has God allowed Satan to continue for so long? Why hasn't he just cut it short? We needed to see, or the angels, all of the universe needed to see Satan's true character. Mm. We need to see Satan's true character. Great answer. That's, yeah. And we needed to see God's character. Mm. We're, we're slow to learn. Mm. We need to see God's character. Exactly. We need to see Satan's character clearly. In contrast to God's character, Dan. If, if we don't let it all play out, then the sin won't stay out. Mm, if we don't let it all play out, sin won't stay out. That's good. Uh, and I agree. And we get a few glimpses of this in Scripture. In John seven fifty one, we see the question: Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? That's a good question. Do we do we judge someone before we hear them out? No, we shouldn't. Likewise, in Deuteronomy, we see the same principle. We see the way that things are to proceed when a controversy comes about. It says, If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days. So, controversy, then two parties come together before the priests and the judges and the Lord. And then what? And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. So this is what needs to happen. We are the priests in the new covenant. We are the judges to look into this controversy between Christ and Satan and see who is telling the truth. That's our job. We are to study fairly both claims and the evidence from both sides. Uh, and we see this clearly in Sister White's writings. Uh, if any of you are unfamiliar with who this is, we have a little booklet called Testing Two Prophets, uh, where we briefly introduce who she is and why we like to quote her. So she has this really great insight. She says, time must be given for Satan to develop the principles which are the foundation of his government. The heavenly universe must see worked out the principles which Satan declared were superior to God's principles. God's order must be contrasted, like you said, with Satan's order. The corrupting principles of Satan's rule must be revealed. This is very, very important. And we have to remember, the plan of salvation isn't all about us. As much as it's as important as it is, it's incredibly important, but what's more important? The safety of the entire universe, of all of God's creation, vindicating God's character in this controversy. So where should we look to find the principles of Satan's government and how it affects mankind throughout history? We go to the fall in the garden. The fall in the garden, yep. Anywhere else? Fall in heaven. Fall in heaven, that's a good one. Yep. Uh, and we also get another idea from this statement in the temptation, where the devil takes Christ up into a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. 
in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. So did Jesus say, No, you, you, who are you to offer me that? Why, why can Satan say this? Yes, it's currently his playground. Uh, Satan is called the God of this world because he usurped authority from Adam and Eve. So he had the right to offer the kingdoms of the world. Well, of course, Christ came to dispute that claim. But when we look at the kingdoms throughout history where Christ is not leading, we see very clearly Satan's kingdom played out. And that's what history is. It's really people living out their perception of God in real time. That's what history is. And, but which, which kingdom should we look at? History's 6,000 years long. Which, where should we look specifically? Mm, Babylon. Agreed. And not only that, but we, God actually gave us a nice object lesson of some very important kingdoms in time all throughout. And I'm assuming most of you are very familiar with this. Uh, here from Daniel 2, we see King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and sees all the statue made of different metals, which God revealed through Daniel that they represent different kingdoms. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and divided Rome. So we're all familiar with that, for the most part. And if you aren't, it's there in Daniel 2. You can read it later. But I want to look at this from a different perspective. I want to look at the parallels between each of these kingdoms because they're incredibly striking and very informative. So, if we study these parallels in history, we'll find a few common strands. Firstly, the ruler is typically a representative of the gods, a divine priest king in most of these kingdoms. And this priest king wields political and spiritual authority. And he also exercises worldwide influence. Religious laws are also created by the religious power, typically, and enforced by the state through force and coercion. This is what we see from Babylon to Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Rome, all the way up to the very end, this common th theme throughout history. This is the DNA of Satan's kingdoms. So what's the first kingdom we're going to look at then? Babylon. So this is an interesting insight. Uh, the ancient Babylonian, or ancient Babylon was ruled by a divine priest king, where earthly kings then were only the representatives or vicars of Enlil, or Bel. Yeah, interesting wording, um, which a lot of you get that. You were a certain religious organization borrowed from that. Yep, that's right. So we have Nebuchadnezzar, the priest king of Babylon. And what did this priest king, this representative of the gods, do with his authority? What do we find in the story of Daniel 3? Daniel 3. Does anyone remember? And is anyone here? Is anyone here? Uh, yes, okay, he gathers all the people together. Not quite the tower. Yes, he gathers all the citizens together. He makes a decree. decree Worship this image or die. Yes. This is what this king does. Yeah, or be thrown into this. He'll burn you alive with fire. Uh, but I mean, we can't blame him. He's imitating the God he worships. Yes. So we have divine priest king, religious law, enforced through, the, enforced through the state on paying of death. Well, how about Medo-Persia? This is the two arms of the statue. And as such, it's two kingdoms, the Medes and the Persians. So let's start with the Medes. Uh, Daniel 6, we have Darius the Mede, who was also known as uh, very elevated. It's disputed whether he was considered divine or not. Uh, but the Persians were greater than the Medes, so the Persians were more than Darius. Anyways, what happens in Daniel 6? You have Darius the Mede here, and some people come to him because they're jealous of Daniel and his privileges because uh, he's really good at his job. And what do they convince the king to do? Make a religious law against praying to God. Exactly. And what happens if you break this religious law? Die. 
death decree. Looks a little, a little too happy about it there. <laughs> uh, so again, same thing. All right, well, how about Persia? Well, we have the king Xerxes or Ahasuerus, however you say that, I don't know. Uh, and these kings were known as the king of kings, which who is the real king of kings and lord of lords? Jesus. Jesus. So what does this uh, divine ruler do with his power in the story of Esther? There's a death decree. But even before that, uh, in Esther chapter 3, Xerxes makes a decree that everyone at this gate, the servant's gate, should do what? Bow, Bow down to Haman. Mm. Well, there was one faithful Jew that would not, Mordecai. Um, and so what did Haman do when he found out Mordecai wouldn't go along with this? Yep. Then, then the death decree. He commences the king. It's like, hey, we need to get rid of all these Jews. And he was also building a gallow for Mordecai as well. So how about Greece? Well, Greece is a little tricky uh, because we don't have a lot of history in scripture, but we have a little bit of prophecy. Uh, we read of this horn on the he-goat in Daniel 8, which is Alexander the Great. Uh, he was deified as the son of Zeus or the son of Ra, depending on which culture he was in at that time. And probably says after his death, the kingdom would be divided into four parts, which would be uh, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and the Seleucid Empire. And I believe the Ptolemy's, Ptolemy Empire and the Seleucid Empire, their rulers also deified themselves. Mm. One of which is Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, most Advents, you only hear about him when you hear about how he is not the little horn of Daniel. Uh, and that's correct, but yes, Hero. Uh, well, what, what year was, um, wait, was he the, the ruler where like, uh, he set the decree in like, uh, like 457? Uh, four, four, no. no, no. Yeah, that was someone different. Um, but Antiochus, though he's not the little horn of Daniel 8, he was not a cool guy. Um, and he made... With his power, he, Epiphanes means God manifest. He claims to be divine, and he made religious laws against the Jews, which you can read about in the book of Maccabees. Mm, the yeah, he forbade the Sabbath, the feasts, uh, many other things. Um, so again, we see same pattern. Well, how about pagan Rome? Did they have any divine rulers? Yeah, the Pontifex Maximus and the emperors, right? This is a depiction of Julius Caesar being taken off into heaven uh, as part of the apotheosis, the deification of the Caesars. This happened after he died. He was assassinated by the Senate. And then uh, his predecessor or successor, Augustus, uh, also claimed, well, if my dad was a god, then I'm the son of God. So he said, and so here's him. Uh, uh, dressed up as Jove, a uh, pagan god. And so what happened in the Roman Empire and found in scripture that matches what we've looked at in history? What happened? Well, when we read the scripture, we find that the Sanhedrin, the church, used Rome, the state, to crucify Christ for breaking what? Man-made man -made religious laws and for claiming to be the son of God. When you look at it, this is the first thing that they were really upset about, him getting, breaking their arbitrary Sabbath laws. Of course, he didn't break the Sabbath. He broke their conception of the Sabbath. Um, and then, of course, they crucified him ultimately. So again, each kingdom, it's the same thing. So what, what follows after Rome in the statue of Daniel 2? We have the iron legs and then feet of iron and, iron and clay. The toes. The toes. That's right. So we have pagan Rome and we have papal Rome. But a lot of people surprisingly don't believe that today. Uh, but if we consider all the parallels, we could ask the question, what's the world, next world power after Rome that had a ruler who claimed to be, what would we assume the ruler would be like? Oh, this next power. He would claim to be a representative of divinity. And what would he claim to wield? Only political power? Civil and religious. Po 
political and spiritual power. And what system had a man that made these claims and also had worldwide influence for the majority of the world to create religious laws? Papacy. Yeah, history seems pretty clear uh, that the papacy fits all of this exactly. Exactly. It's all the same. And so here's a picture of the popes in the Middle Ages, one of the kings coming to kiss the papal slipper, which they actually got that from the Persian Empire, wow, which is know. interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. This historian has some good insight, saying, the mighty Catholic Church was little more than the Roman, Roman Empire baptized. The very capital of the old Roman Empire became the capital of the Christian Empire. The office of Pontifex Maximus was continued in that of the Pope. Pontifex Maximus was the king of the pagan priesthood in ancient Rome, which Julius Caesar was elected to, uh, and is why after his succession, then the emperors were also the, the king and the priests of the empire. And then when Rome was Christianized, just transfer that over. So in 538 AD, uh, we see that the papacy, just like Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, this divine priest king made a religious law. And we see it says, whereas the people are persuaded that they ought not to travel on the Lord's day, talking about Sunday, with the horses or oxen or carriages, or to prepare anything for food or to do anything conducive to the cleanliness of houses or men. But from rural work, such as plowing, cultivating vines, reaping, mowing, thrashing, etc., etc., we judge it better to abstain that the people may the more readily come to the churches and have leisure for prayers. If anyone be found doing the works forbidden above, let him be punished, not as the civil authorities may direct, but as the ecclesiastical powers may determine. And so that was one of the multiple events that happened in 538 that began the 1260 year prophecy. So we just covered a lot of ground. But to recap, we see in Babylon, religious laws of worshiping an image made by the king, enforced by the state with the penalty of death in the fiery furnace. In media, we see the religious law, pray to the king, made by the wise man, wise men, enforced by the state with the penalty of the lion's den. In Persia, the decree bow to Haman, made by the king, enforced by the state, or else they hang Mordecai on the gallows. In Greece, uh, we have Sabbath laws, etc., made by the king, enforced by the state, decree of death. Mm -hmm. Rome, again, Sabbath laws against Christ, made by the church, the Sanhedrin, enforced by the state, penalty, crucifixion. The papacy, Sabbath laws, made by the church, enforced by the state, and they're very creative with their punishments. So... This is the broad overview of these kingdoms. There's a reason why God gave us a lot of these stories in scripture pertaining to these kingdoms. He's trying to teach us something. So the question is, what can we learn from these kingdoms' actions about the nature of Satan's kingdom? The same love, liberty, and freedom? No. Punitive justice. Tyranny. Punitive yeah. justice. Tyranny. Yes. And... But there's something else we can learn, and we can only learn it through the cross of Christ. Because in Rome, we see the, the physical fruit of Satan's kingdom of religious coercion, which is the brutal and unjust murder of the innocent son of God. Satan's methods, he claims they're so good and wonderful, but they always end in the oppression and suffering of the innocent. This is what the cross teaches us, one of the many things. But... And we, we, we can understand this, but it's even deeper than that because when you study out the cross, we know it's more than just what happened 2,000 years ago. We know this because, for instance, Christ said to Saul on the way to Damascus, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then Saul asked, who are you, Lord? And the voice replied, what? I am Jesus. The one you're persecuting. Was Saul beating Jesus up? How? What was happening? Through his, people. Through his people. When Jesus' children are persecuted, Christ is suffering with them. Consider what Christ said in Matthew 25. He said, Then the king will turn to those on his left, 
talking about the goats, right? Goats on the left, sheep on the right. And he'll say to them, away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his demons. Why? For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they asked, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison? When did we not help you? What are you talking about? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help me. Solemn words. So, and I love how Ellen White said it. This is really good. She says, few give thought to the suffering that sin has caused our creator. All have been suffered in Christ's agony. But that suffering did not begin or end with his manifestation in humanity. Now check out how she defines the cross. She says, the cross is what? A revelation to our dull senses of the pain that, from its very inception, sin has brought to the heart of God. Can we fathom that? Can we? We should try. We should try. We should try. And no, notice this. Daily, he suffers the agonies of the crucifixion. Every human that suffers on earth, Christ is suffering with them. He's experiencing the result of Satan's kingdom, the wages of sin, death, suffering, persecution, religious intolerance. Christ is with them in the middle of it. So when we read these histories from Babylon to Rome and we see what's happening to God's children, what are we really seeing? Exactly. It's not just these people that are being persecuted. It's Christ in them being persecuted. So when Daniel's friends are bound up, who did they tie up? Who did the Babylonians tie up? Was it just these three Hebrews? Who was it? It was Jesus. Who did they throw into the fire? It was Jesus. And this is why the king was astonished. And he said, didn't we just cast three people into the fire? And then they answered, yeah. But then what do they see? And the king said, I see four. And they're loose and walking around. The fourth looks like the son of God. This is the cross. This is the crucifixion of Christ, spiritually, way back when. This is incredible. This is so important for us to contemplate. So each time these kingdoms persecute God's children, they're in reality crucifying the Son of God afresh. Daniel's friends thrown into the fiery furnace. That's the cross. Daniel thrown in the lion's den. That's the cross. And more than that, What's the result of crucifying Christ? If we reject it, what happens? If we receive this revelation of God's love and our need for a Savior, and we reject that, what's the natural result? Death, destruction. And that's where the wages of sin and the justice of God come into play. So we're going to see what's the result of crucifying Christ through these kingdoms. But let's start with the physical. What happened when Israel rejected Christ? They said, we have no king but Caesar. You know, they said, is this your king, the king of the Jews? It's like, no, Caesar alone. And in that instance, the church, Israel, officially divorced Christ. They said, we don't, we don't want you here. But little did they realize he was the only one who could protect them. His presence was their salvation. They divorced him and married the state, committing spiritual adultery and idolatry. And Christ warned about this. He said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. So what happened when Israel rejected Christ? Soon after that, what happened? Utter annihilation. They got what they wanted. They said, we just want Rome. That's our husband. Here's what Ellen White says. 
The Jews had forged their own fetters. They had filled for themselves the cup of vengeance. This is interesting. Notice how she uses the, the term vengeance. What is God's vengeance? In the utter destruction that befell them as a nation, and in all the woes that followed them in their dispersion, they were but reaping the harvest which their own hands had sown. Says the prophet, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. She continues, Their sufferings are often represented as a punishment visited upon them by the direct decree of God. Right? Jesus gave the parable, what will happen to the people, right, who rejected, they were lent the land, uh, and they kill the son of the landowner, right? He goes and he sends an army to go destroy them. That's symbolic of this event. So it's often in scripture we read about it, God directly punishing them by the decree of God. But notice what she says. It is thus that the great deceiver seeks to conceal his own work. Interesting. Interesting. By stubborn rejection of divine love and mercy, the Jews had caused the protection of God to be withdrawn from them, and Satan was permitted to rule them according to his will. The horrible cruelties enacted in the destruction of Jerusalem are a demonstration of Satan's vindictive power over those who yield to his control. I recommend reading the context of this quote because there's many more gems in there. Um, So, What happened when those that threw Christ into the fiery furnace after that? What happened to them? The fires they kindled consumed them. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. You reap what you sow. Those who threw Daniel's friends into the fiery furnace were killed by their own actions. And this is why scripture says the Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The word judgment there can also mean justice. So what is God's justice? The wicked is snared in the work of his own hand. That's God's justice. It would be unjust, it would be unfair to take away the harvest of a farmer. It's not fair. So the wicked have worked for this, and that's what they get. Jeremiah says, I am the Lord, I the Lord search the heart, I try the reins even to give every man what? According to his own ways, and according to the fruit of his doings. So that was Babylon. Well, what about media? What happened to those that threw Daniel's friends in the fiery furnace? Or, sorry, the lion's den, excuse me. What happened to them? They were thrown into it. Those who threw Daniel in the the lion's den were themselves thrown into the lion's den. The wicked conceive evil. They are pregnant with trouble and give birth to lies. They dig a deep pit to trap others, then fall into it themselves. That's the justice of God. Thus, God's justice is satisfied. But he's not happy about it. No, we just saw it's the suffering. That's still Christ has... Immense, enormous, incalculable pain. Absolutely. He not only suffers with the innocent, but also the guilty. The trouble they make for others backfires on them. The violence they plan falls on their own heads. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. This is what happens. And who's the serpent? What's the hedge of protection? The law of God that we can only fulfill through Christ living in and through us. Okay, how about Persia? We saw in Babylon, those that kindled the fire for Daniel's friends were killed by that fire. Those that dug a pit to throw Daniel in fell into that pit. How about Persia? Haman built some gallows for Mordecai. Let's see what happens. Harbana, one of the king's eunuchs said, there's a gallows 75 feet tall at Haman's house that he made for Mordecai, who gave the report that saved the king. The king said, hang him on it. Who? Hang Mordecai or Haman? They hanged Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's anger subsided. You reap what you sow. Well, how about Greece? This is a little bit more obscure because it's not all in Scripture. We have to look to the Apocrypha, but pretty much 2 Maccabees talks about 
Antiochus, he loses a battle, he's really upset, and he blames it on the Jews. He's like, he tells his charioteer, go as fast as you can, don't stop until we get there to destroy them all. And on the way, he falls out of his chariot uh, and gets very badly injured and dies soon after that. Uh, other accounts talk about how he had tortured people uh, in their bowels uh, who disagreed with him. And right before this fall, he actually got very sick and had very immense pain in his bowels, which is very interesting. So God, like it says, God, in Maccabees it says, God smote him with an invisible plague. But how would we understand that? How does God smite people with sickness? Did Jesus ever bring sickness? No. What did he... He only healed. So how should we understand this? God couldn't protect him anymore. Exactly. Antiochus got to the point where he had completely rejected the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God persistently resisted. Is at last what? Withdrawn from the center. Yes, oftentimes sickness can manifest. Sicknesses can be a manifestation of spiritual or mental or other relational problems. So yes, I would not be surprised if that was the case here. So scripture says, they would none of my counsels, they despise all my reproofs, which is what happened with Antiochus. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. Okay, and how about papal Rome? We already looked at pagan Rome. So we'll jump ahead to Papal Rome. All right, for my history nerds, who was the first state power that the papacy used to persecute heretics? The first official state, the first nation. France? France. Hey, uh, nice. That was, that's right, it was France under King Clovis. This is a picture, a carving of the baptism of Clovis in 508 AD. Some people say it was 496 there's evidence that it was 508, I think it was. Um, and here it is again, Clovis' baptism in 508. So France was the first sword the papacy used to uproot the Visigoths, one of the non-Trinitarian Aryan groups uh, living around there. And they uprooted them by dismantling their government pretty much. And that happened in 508. And by the way, it's interesting because 1290 years later, you come to 1798, just as from 538 plus 1260 is also 1798. But at that point, the sword that the papacy used to kill the Visigoths, the French, was the same power that uprooted the papacy. The papacy used France to destroy a government of another nation, their political power. And then 1290 years later, the papacy uprooted, or France uprooted the political power of the papacy. And here's the record of that in 1798, um, where they declared it a Roman Republic, pretty much, where they lost their temporal power officially, which is interesting. You can actually see this on the currency. Uh, there's a change in currency at this point. This is from Pope Pius VI, his reign during this time. Uh, you can see here 23, the 23rd, uh, year of his reign. So right at the beginning of 1798 is when that would have been. And this was right after, also 1798. Same coin, wow. but one, you see the papal tiara with the two keys of Peter. And on the right, you see the Republica Romana with the frigging cap and the fasces. Uh, also in their banknotes. Papacy and then Republica Romana. Went from a theocracy to a republic in 1798. So, this is why Revelation 13 says, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. The word sword here can also mean, according to Strong's Dictionary, judicial punishment. Which is very interesting. Because that's what the papacy did. It did judicial punishment against the Visigoths and took away their ability to make and enforce laws uh, through France. 
And then France at the end, the sword that they used, uh, also took away the papacy's ability to make and enforce laws legally. And again, Christ said, put away your sword. Those who use the sword die by the sword. So there we see Babylon, Medo-Persia, Babylon, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the papacy. It's the same history, just a little bit different each time. Same process of a divine priest king making religious laws, enforcing these laws through force and coercion, and then suffering the natural consequences, their actions boomerang back on their own head. But we can take this even further into the future. The fate of the end time apostate churches, spiritual Babylon. And it's, it's very sad that a lot of people make fun of the Adventist pr- interpretation of end time events. Like, oh, who could ever believe that a powerful government would make religious laws and persecute God's people? Like, well, maybe it's not so, maybe it's not so crazy. So in Revelation 17, we read about one of the angels with one of the bulls of the wrath of God. And he says to John, come, I will show you how the notorious prostitute who sits on many waters will be judged. This is very interesting. So this is how the judgment will happen to the prostitute. What is a prostitute in prophecy? A false church. A false church. A woman in prophecy is a church, pure woman, good church, whore, bad church. So let's see it. Revelation 17, 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast. Remember, it's the woman riding the beast. The church riding the state. So saying the ten horns on the beast. The state shall hate the whore, the church, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So keep in mind, what does the apostate churches do in the end? They use the state to enforce their religious laws. And then at the end, those that they manipulated destroy them. And I forgot to include the Ellen White quote about that, but come find me later if you want it. Absolutely, for those watching. Just like she burned many people with fire, right? So will she be burned with fire? It's also also interesting how in the end of Revelation talks about how the whore will be thrown into fire and destroyed. This says it's the state that does it, actually. That's kind of interesting. Well, that's a lot to unpack. So the power the church has used to kill the saints will turn on her and kill her. Obadiah 15. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. So what about the fate of Satan? Satan deceived and manipulated the whole world. And what happens to him in the end? Notwithstanding that Satan has been constrained, this is after the millennium, restrained, constrained to acknowledge God's justice and to bow to the supremacy of Christ, his character remains unchanged. The spirit of rebellion, like a mighty torrent, again bursts forth. Filled with frenzy, he determines not to yield the great controversy. The time has come for a last desperate struggle against the king of heaven. This is after Satan had mustered the resurrected wicked and said, let's attack the city. And then all the wicked see in like panoramic view the history of Christ and crucified and their part in all of that. And that's after this. This is the context. So what does Satan do? He rushes into the midst of his subjects and endeavors to inspire them with his own fury and arouse them to instant battle. But of all the countless millions whom he has alerted into rebellion, there are none now to acknowledge his supremacy. His power is at an end. The wicked are filled with the same hatred of God that inspires Satan, but they see their case as hopeless, that they cannot prevail against Jehovah. So what do they do? Their rage is kindled against Satan, and those who have been his agents in deception, and with the fury of demons, they turn upon him. And then she quotes Ezekiel 28, this part, where it says, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, a type of Satan, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, 
Yet thou art a man and not a God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to, into, down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man, and no God, in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord. So again, this is the fruit of Satan's kingdom. It just self-destructs. It doesn't work. The principles of selfishness, it always ends in ruin. When you try to manipulate someone into doing your will, it will always turn back on your own head. So remember what we saw at the beginning. Time must be given for Satan to develop the principles for the foundation of his government. He got a bunch of different time. He got 1,260 years, 1,290 years, 2,300 years. Now, now in the end, after 1844, we've had enough history to see the natural result of Satan's kingdom throughout time. We see the principles of his kingdom and what happens in the end. And all of this for the purpose that the heavenly universe can see worked out the principles which Satan declared were superior to God's. God's order must be contrasted with Satan's order. The corrupting principles of Satan's government, Satan's rule, must be revealed. And this is why God allows the wicked to reap what they sow. This is why God does not step in and end their life quickly, immediately. Because if he did that, then how would anyone know what the result of Satan's kingdom is? God has to let them reap what they sow, as sad and as hard as it is. Mm -hmm. He has to do this in love. In immense pain to himself. Exactly. Satan has had time. So now it's up to us to review history and see the results of Satan's kingdom. Misery, death, and destruction. The persecuting of the innocent. You know, and the challenge with history is right now we see conflict in the Middle East. We see conflict in... Eastern Europe and you know we see conflict everywhere we see racial conflict and everybody is trying to somehow obscure or you know cover up the fact that all of our history if we really look at the history of humanity it is full of violence and hatred and destruction mm -hmm. there is no group of people on this planet that are somehow righteous compared to another group none are righteous no not one that's right so the question, first angel's message, the hour of God's judgment has come. How you judge God, how you view God and see him will change your own character. You become like the person you worship. And we see the result of worshiping a God of force and violence in all of these kingdoms. And we see the end result of that. So I hope that this way of viewing prophecy was a blessing. Um, we as Adventists have been giving a very unique way of interpreting these kingdoms but typically we do it very dryly and don't show these common threads because mm. it's a perfect parallel from beginning to end and it's very important to bring out these aspects mm. and much more could be said about all of this but i pray that as we go and teach people about prophecy and these things that will incorporate these principles about the character of god and the wages of sin mm. Mm. Yeah. But I said that, you know, if you think about it, when you read Revelation 13, it says they're going to pass, we'll live this long, hmm. and we won't be able to buy or sell, or pay there will be death, and it's not the Democrats who are going to pass, we'll live this long. Hmm. And that, you know, oftentimes, I mean, I don't know that for certain, but, you know, they don't tend to be religious. Hmm. And they, Satan has gotten so scared of this horrible side, everybody's running 
taking care of him to be our savior. Mm -hmm. And so, but if you know these things, mm -hmm. you know, then we can start writing like, hey, wait a minute. These people, even though they seem better, they're still the two wings of the same hateful bird. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The, yeah. Which do you want? The, the Pharisees or the Sadducees? Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, it's very sad seeing the, the vision in society today. And I understand the reaction of the right to the left because some of those things going on are not great, to put it lightly. Um, but yes, I think there will definitely be an overcorrection. And this history, can, I pray that it will help give you all some information to bring up to people on why we are concerned about things. Um, and if any of you want more information, um, I have this book over there, uh, shameless plug. Uh, but chapter four was about this idea for the most part. So if any of you are interested, I'd love to talk to you more about it or you can read about it. What's the book called? Forbidden Fruit. Uh, because it parallels a lot of the events in Genesis to the events in Revelation. There's many, many parallels. In Genesis, you have the woman giving the forbidden fruit to man, and in the end you have the woman giving the forbidden wine to the state, mm -hmm. symbol of the man. Um, yes, so mm -hmm. praise, praise God. God. All right, with that said, let's have a prayer and we can fellowship some more. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being such a loving God and for pointing out the pitfalls uh, of the enemy, Father. Thank you for so clearly revealing uh, the fruit of saints' philosophy, God, throughout all these kingdoms. Thank you so much for being able to teach us so much history and such important principle, and principles in very simple ways, Father. I pray that we'll be able to internalize these things and help us to always keep in mind the fact that you're suffering with all who suffer, Father. You're there. You don't just leave them alone. You're right there with them, God. So when we see that, help us to see you and other people, Father. Help us to seek to relieve your suffering and those oppressing you uh, by love and by self-sacrifice. We ask that you'll guide us as we go from here, and I pray that as we fellowship, that your spirit will linger and will inspire our conversations, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.